Welcome, friends, to another episode of Theology Applied, and we are continuing in our Ordo Salutis, or the Order of Salvation. Remember that we only have three more to go. Today, we're talking about sanctification. Sanctification is a word that we never use outside of Christian circles. Uh, It simply means to grow into the image of Jesus. If I was to give a most simple definition, God is working in us and through us to make us more into the image of Jesus. This is Romans 8 to 29. Lexham Dictionary definition is this. It's longer, it's helpful. Sanctification refers broadly to the concept of being set apart as sacred. Sanctify to set apart. This idea that Christians have been made holy before God through their faith in Christ is related to justification. In Christian theology, a distinction is sometimes made between justification and sanctification, where justification refers to having saving faith and sanctification refers to the process of gradual, that's an important word, gradual purification from sin and progressive progressive in the good sense, progressive spiritual growth that should mark the life of the believer. This doctrine of sanctification draws on New Testament passages that emphasize a move toward holy and righteous living that characterize following Christ in faith. Okay, so I want to focus in on the both progressiveness and the process and the gradualness of sanctification. Sanctification is not like justification in that in justification we're declared righteous, we're declared not guilty, and it's simply a declaration by God legally as a judge. Sanctification is something that is taking place Monday through Monday, Monday through Monday. This is the Christian life. And so sanctification is from the moment of our justification to the moment of our glorification, we experience this sanctification. Now, there is an initial sense in which we are set apart, which we read at the beginning of the definition, that God sets us apart unto himself, and we are, in a sense, declared holy or sanctified or set apart, different than those in the world who are not justified, who are not predestined, elect, called, uh, regenerate, justified, adopted. We are, in that sense, sanctified initially. But the process or the gradualness of sanctification is, a, is an entire uh, Christian life lived out. And so we're going to take multiple episodes on sanctification. This one, my goal is simply to define it clearly, see it in the scripture, and then emphasize both God's working and our working in sanctification. And then in episodes to come, we'll talk very practically about what we actually do in sanctification. All right, so 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 3, Paul the Apostle is exhorting the Thessalonians, and he's nearing the end of his letter here. There's five chapters in 1 Thessalonians, and he says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. Now, that's important. You receive from us how you ought to walk. That's an image of living out the Christian life. And in Galatians later, we'll see we are to walk or live out the Christian life by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So he says, you receive from us how how you ought to walk and to please God. So how to live in a way that pleases God, just as you are doing. And then he affirms these Thessalonian believers, you're doing this already. That you do so more and more. Progress. Okay, you're doing it already, but you need to continue progressing more and more into the image of Christ. And then he says this, verse 2. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. All right, that's important. So at the end of verse three here, Paul says to these Thessalonian believers, this is God's will for you. 
And we're like, I want it to be more complex than this. Rather, he just says, your sanctification, your growth in godliness. This is what God has for you. And so Christian, watching this or listening to this, you want to know God's will for your life? This is it, that you grow, that you progress in holiness, that you mature into Jesus likeness. Now, we don't look like Jesus physically. Rather, this is growing into his character and his quality as a human being. We grow in Christ likeness. We become small g godly, godlike. This is sanctification and it takes an entire lifetime. Romans 6.19, Paul here refers to sanctification again. He says, for just as you once, Roman Christians, you, just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, uh, members meaning body parts, you presented your body parts as slaves to impurity. You were uh, a slave of sin, a slave of Satan, like we saw last week. Uh, When you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, that leading to more lawlessness, so lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now, here is the contrast, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Okay, So this is practical. Paul says, as you once presented your body to sin so that sin could use your body And that resulted in lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, spiraling down into greater lawlessness. Now, the opposite, the antithesis is true. You are to present your members, your body part, as slaves to righteousness. What is prescribed in the scriptures as right living. You are to present your body as slaves to righteousness. What will that lead to? Sanctification, growth, progressively into Jesus likeness. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology has a helpful definition for us to consider. Sanctification is a progressive, important word, work throughout our earthly lives. So this this takes our entire life from justification to glorification or to the moment we die. Uh, A progressive work throughout our earthly lives. It is also a work in which God and believers cooperate. All right, now that's important. This is not something that God simply does through us and we're on some automatic button where it's just, we're passive and God is just moving through us, growing us, we do nothing. No, Grudem is right. He says, in which God and believers co-together operate. We cooperate. Each playing distinct roles. This part of the application of redemption is called sanctification. Sanctification is a progressive work of God and believers that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. So we grow less and less attached to sin and we grow more and more into the image of Jesus. As we said last week, it's not that we are sinless, but as we grow, we sin less. Progressive sanctification is what the Bible teaches. Now, there are some strange doctrines out there, some strange theologies that teach sanctification by some kind of second blessing of the Holy Spirit or some kind of second baptism of the Holy Spirit or even some kind of crisis of life or crisis of faith that you you just propel into this deeper walk with Christ. It's almost an instant sanctification. It's almost this microwave sanctification. But sadly, this is not what the Bible teaches. And sometimes we do see this kind of idea lived out, but I would argue that most of those people who have some kind of crisis or some kind of moment that after that moment they are they're changed forever, I would say that's probably the moment they were born again and regenerate rather than they were Christians all along and w- living some kind of weak, you know, godless life and then God hit them with this second blessing or this crisis that made them propel into a deeper life. Rather, they were not born again. They were simply attached to the church, attached to Jesus, attached to the Holy Spirit in a Hebrews 6 kind of way where they tasted of his power, but they never actually experienced the new birth or or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so there are people who do experience a moment of great transformation when before they were professing to belong to Jesus. My argument would be 
They didn't really belong. They were just attached. And that was the moment of regeneration and filling of the Holy Spirit. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 13 to 15, you got to remember the context of Paul and Timothy. Paul was uh, Timothy's father in the faith. He was a father figure. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. And Paul exhorted Timothy in 1st and 2nd Timothy. They're called pastoral epistles. They're letters from Paul to Timothy about how he should govern the church, how he should deal with problems, and how he should pay attention to himself in the ministry. And Paul clearly lays out for Timothy a progressive sanctification here. And so he says, devote yourself, Timothy, to the public reading of scripture. This is what you're supposed to do as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Timothy. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture to exhortation, challenge people uh, with the scriptures, Timothy. That's what exhortation is. And to teaching. Okay, so there's the three things. Public reading of scripture, exhortation, challenge them with the scriptures, and three, teach the word. Teach the Bible. And then he says, practice these things. So practice means it's an ongoing effort. We get better as we practice something. Okay, practice these things immerse yourself in them. I love that. Immerse yourself in these three things, Timothy, so that this will result so that all may see your progress. So for Timothy, he is going to progress in his skills, in his abilities. He's going to grow in his ability to read scripture. He's going to grow in his ability to skillfully exhort the church. He's going to grow in his ability to teach. So if you heard Timothy teaching in year one, and then you heard him in year 10, you're going to be like, man, Timothy has grown in 10 years. He has progressed in 10 years. And then Paul says, persist in this. Persist. Okay. And that's in verse 16. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Now that's important. I think that's worth pausing for a moment. Paul says, don't just keep your eye on the Bible and on the teaching. Also watch yourself. And the reason this is, is because even as Christians, we still are tempted, right? Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are or were, but yet without sin. And so Jesus never failed at temptation, but we continue to be attacked by Satan and the enemy, and we give in to temptation. So Timothy, you are to keep a close watch on yourself. Watch your life. Make sure you're growing. Make sure you're paying attention to your holiness, and watch the teaching. You can get in trouble in those two places. Don't defect as in character, and don't defect in teaching or doctrine. And then he says, persist in this, persist in the reading of scripture, exhortation, teaching, and persist in keeping a close watch on yourself and on the teacher, on the teaching for by so doing, listen to this, you will save both yourself (laughs) and your hearers. Now that's kind of crazy. We have to understand that Paul doesn't mean here that Timothy, by working out you know, you're, you're exhorting and you're public reading of scripture and you're teaching and watching yourself and keeping a close eye on the teaching, God's going to save you from sin and from hell. No, he's saying that there will be a continual salvation from sin and temptation. We'll see this again later in Philippians 2. But when a person is already regenerate and born again, they don't ever need to get born again and regenerate again. They are already saved, past tense. But there is an ongoing saving of us from current sins, the sins that so easily entangle us. We need saved from current sins that grab upon us. And so he says, if you do this, if you persist, you will save both yourself you will persevere, that's a a podcast to come, and your hearers. Timothy, this is important, do this, progressive. Now, there's an image in the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah that I wanna pick up on here to, to add to the image of progressing. Isaiah, Old Testament prophet, 700 years before Jesus, uh, prophesies about Christ a lot, especially in Isaiah 53. Isaiah gives this image of a tree being planted by God and it growing into this massive oak tree, an oak of righteousness. Now, interestingly, this is Isaiah 61. 
This Isaiah 61 is the same text that Jesus quotes in Luke 4 when he is victorious over Satan's temptation. He is filled with the Spirit, and he comes back to his hometown. He's in the synagogue. Uh, He is given the, the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolls it to the place, and he reads Isaiah 61, and then he gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down, and he looks at everybody, and everybody's looking at him, and he says, Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, that's what I want to read that Jesus quotes. It's in Isaiah 61, verse 3. He says, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, interestingly, this is the text that Jesus used to prove his work as a Messiah. You know, And, and so one of the things Jesus is going to do is he's going to plant trees that will grow into oaks of righteousness that will result in God being glorified. So one of the things Jesus came to do is, yes, proclaim good news to the captives and and release the oppressed, the spiritually oppressed, and and to do good, uh, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the good news, but to plant people that will grow or be sanctified, grow in holiness, and will become oaks of righteousness that God may be glorified. Now, if you were to ever come to my house, and I was to take you into the the field that surrounds half of my house, you would see probably the biggest oak tree you've ever seen in your life. If I, I have a big wingspan here, I can't even get my arms around half of this oak tree. It is so large. It has to be hundreds of years old. And it is so big, I, you couldn't even cut it down with, with one chainsaw. It would be impossible. It's so large and so rooted and so planted. Um, That's what I think of when I think of oaks of righteousness. That's what I think about when I think of progressive sanctification. We grow from a a small acorn and and there's a sapling and then it grows into a small young tree and then pretty soon there's little acorns and then all, you know, hundreds of years later, there's this massive, rooted, unshakable tree, this oak of righteousness. That's the image of progressive sanctification. We start off as a tiny little acorn and then we're a little sapling and then we grow into a, a, a baby tree and then we get a little stronger and, and you know we do get blown around by the storms, the thunderstorms and the windstorms and the microbursts, but we, we grow and those storms help our roots to go further down into the ground and grip the rich nutrients. In the same way, we grow by storms in our lives. And, and prayerfully, the storms don't knock us off of the track of being a Christian and clinging to Christ. Hopefully, they propel you deeper into Christ. They make your roots go down deeper and cling to him more uh, firmly. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit of application, and this is going to be the rest of the podcast. It's about half of it because sanctification is about us living. And so I want to talk application at this point. In sanctification here, um, we are hitting on a new kind of action in our order of, of salvation. In predestined and election, that's all God doing. We're, we're passive. In God calling us, we're also passive. This is just God calling us to faith. In regeneration, it's God doing it. We don't do anything. Faith, we respond to the gift of faith given to us and we exercise belief out of our regeneration, but that's also a work of God, and we just express the faith that is given to us. In addition, the repentance is a gift of God. Remember from 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, but we actually do the turning. So we do the believing, we do the turning, but it's God gifting us, enable, enabling us to do that. In justification, we're passive. God declares us to be righteous, but in an adoption, we are placed in his family. We're also passive, but here in sanctification, we work, we do, we act, we put forth effort, energy, okay? And so that's what I want to focus on now. Sanctification brings us into a new plane of us acting out what God is doing in us. So there's a, there's a synergistic nature to sanctification, S-Y-N, two or more working, uh, E-G, or meaning, uh, energy and then the ism is the the system so the the synergism or the synergistic way in which sanctification works is that it's god and us working for our growth 
Now, Dr. R.C. Sproul, a, a fantastic theologian who's now deceased, uh, a, a dead hero of mine, says this, We are saved by grace alone and justified by faith alone. But having been saved, we don't just wait around to die. Christianity is about spiritual growth as well. And spiritual growth involves effort, the hard work of sanctification. We manifestly don't work for our regeneration or our justification. Both acts are monergistic. We, we covered that in a previous podcast. Accomplished by God alone. Only the Holy Spirit can change our hearts. Only the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of the Son of God, secured by his perfect obedience to the Father, can secure our right standing before God. Sanctification includes our efforts. We say it is synergistic because both God and we are doing something. Yet, we aren't equal partners. God wills and works in us according to his good pleasure so that we progress in holiness. Philippians 2, 12, and 13. We'll hit that in a second. But as God works in us, we work as well. Pursuing him in prayer, relying on the means of grace, the preached word and the sacraments, seeking to be reconciled to those we have offended. That's forgiveness and reconciliation. There's no shortcut for sanctification. Remember, no crisis, no second baptism of the Holy Spirit, no second blessing, no shortcut. That's shortcut sanctification. It's a process or a progress. And one that all too often seems overly plodding. <laughs> I love that word plodding. It means to walk with heavy steps. Like, you know, it's like you're in mud and you're... Plodding is, is what sanctification is like. This process taking years to discern. Meaning, we don't see the growth happening in us. Often, it's only after years of being a Christian can we look back at ourselves and see, wow, I've grown a lot. Or you have a conversation with someone and you start to, to speak the word of God in a way that you forgot you even knew. And you're like, wow, all that's in me. Uh, you resist temptation and, and you realize, wow, I, I never thought I would be able to, to stand in the face of that kind of temptation. And you've grown, but you didn't notice it. It's almost like uh, when you look back at old pictures of yourself, you never saw yourself growing, but you look back and you're a different person today than you were when you were in those old pictures. Now, Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says this. Paul speaking to the church at Philippi. He says, and this is just on the heels of that wonderful um, humiliation of Jesus or the humbling of Jesus where he didn't count equality with God a thing to hold on to, but humbled himself, made himself nothing, being obedient even to the cross. That's, this is just on the heels of that text. Verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, in light of Jesus' example, as you have always obeyed, so we're talking obedience, just as you've always obeyed. Remember, Christ obeyed even to death, death on the cross. Just as you always obeyed. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So not just when I'm here watching you, but when I'm not there. Work out, listen to this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm going to stop there before I go to 13. Again, as we talked previously, the working out of salvation here is not salvation from the penalty of our sin. The penalty of our sin is hell, is separation from God's love and mercy and grace, and it's the active uh, justice of God and wrath of God on us in hell forever. It's not that, okay? This is salvation from present sin in your life. That's what we are to work out because we learn in Paul's other writings, salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, not of works so that no one can boast. So, so the scriptures never contradict each other. So what he has to mean here is salvation from current sins. We need saved from the sins that right now so easily entangle us. 
because the wages of sin is death. And, and Paul wants to spare us, Jesus wants to spare us from the death of relationships and the death of opportunities and, and the death of, of physical well-being. I mean, there are consequences to sin and we need saved from current sins. So he says, you work, work out your salvation and you do this with fear and trembling. Now the fear and trembling needs 13. Okay, so 13 says for or because. So why would we why would we be in fear and in trembling? Because or for it is God who works in you both to will, that's the choosing mechanism of the human being, and to work, that's the acting, the, the doing, your hands and feet and your 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 tongue, both to will and to act. I love it, or to work for his good pleasure or for his glory, as we said earlier. So you notice here, uh, there's a synergistic nature to this here. This is both us working, work out your salvation, but then in the very next verse, it says for or because it's God working in you. Now that's important. That means that when we grow or when we work to kill sin, Romans 8, 13, by the Spirit put to death the misdeeds of the body. We'll get into that into a, di- a different podcast on sanctification. When we are actively seeking to put to death sin, seeking actively the, the normal means of grace, which we'll close with today, when we're doing the work of sanctification, we must remember it is God who is at work in us and through us. It is his movement. It is the Holy Spirit, uh, which we'll look at in just a second in Galatians 5. So, This is not salvation from past sin, the penalty of past sin. This is salvation from current sins that are in our lives. Okay, we need to work that out. We need to put effort and energy into it. Uh, We don't just allow God to to take over and we're in some passive state where he just does the work for us. No, we do the work. But it's him working in us and through us. Even initiating the choosing to kill the sin, right? Because it says both to will, that's the choosing, and to act, that's the working or the doing. So in and through our willing is God. In and through our working is God. It's God in us together, but God must be the initiator. Uh, But from our perspective, it will look and feel like we're doing the work. We're the one putting in the blood, sweat, and tears. In a sense, that's true. But in a mysterious way, it would not be happening unless God were moving through us and in us, even in the choosing to grow and to work. All right, Galatians 5, 15 to 17. Now, Paul is closing, in a sense, his letter to the Galatians. He has already fleshed out the gospel, and now he's, he's getting into the very practical nature of living the Christian life after the gospel. And he says to these Galatian Christians, walk by the Spirit. Now, this Spirit here is not uh, some random Spirit or your Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. So remember our previous verse, it's God at work in you. God in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity who works sanctification in us, both to will and act. And so Paul says, you cooperate in this by walking living by the Spirit. And that just simply means we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. We depend on his power, not our own. And our own would look like flesh. He says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh is you minus the working of God. It's all you have before regeneration. Before regeneration, all you have is your sin nature or your flesh. But after regeneration, you'll remember, we have a new spirit, which gives us spiritual life. We have uh, a new heart, which produces new desires. And we have a new presence in us, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And so we are to seek to live by his energy and his strength and not that previous resource of flesh or sin nature even to do good, okay? We're not to walk by our flesh to do good. That is not appropriate. That's not what we're instructed to do. We are to do good by the Spirit. And yes, it's us acting it out with our bodies. Yes, it's us thinking and rejecting with our own uh, mind and thoughts, but it's the Spirit at work in us. And so we must be conscious 
and pleading for the Spirit's work. So if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Your flesh is at enmity with God, Romans 8. It's at war with God and doesn't want to submit to God, nor can it do so. And so your new spiritual life in you, you're alive in Christ, Ephesians 2, the Holy Spirit within you is pushing against your flesh and wanting you to move in the power of God and you will desire to live rightly and walk rightly. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. All that means in verse 17 is, if you give in to the flesh, and if you walk by your own resources, you will fail. And the truth is, there are warring energies within you. Your flesh, which is temptable, and 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 sometimes is used by Satan as a, as a ground... Uh, a place to launch war from, a stronghold to launch from, temptations, eyes, uh, thoughts, appetites, bodily desires, uh, ears, pride of life, you know, boasting of what one has and does, lust of the eyes. And so if you're walking by the flesh, we can be sure that we are not pleasing God, but we don't have just the flesh option anymore. Right? Romans 7, Paul says, there's nothing good that lives in me that is in my flesh or in my sin nature. No, we have the Holy Spirit, we have a new spirit, we have a new heart. And so there's our resources for sanctification. And if we are actively walking by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We will overcome. We will be victorious. Now, to be sure, we will grow into this victoriousness. Remember, I said earlier, it's not that when we become Christians, we are sinless. But as we grow as Christians or are sanctified, we sin less. We experience more and more victory over sin and temptation. Our attitudes change. We begin to develop and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. All right, now let's talk, just in closing here, the normal means of grace. Here's your action, okay? What can I do to grow as a Christian. This is gonna seem so simplistic, but often it's the basics that are the most important things, okay? We want the deep, we want the esoteric, we want the secret. Listen, this is normal, everyday, non-spectacular Christianity, but it's the normal, everyday, non-spectacular that helps you grow and be sanctified. It's the plodding, if you will, that we heard from Sproul earlier. What is it? It's the normal means of grace. Not super normal means of grace that we want. No, it's the normal means of grace. What is it? Prayer, Bible reading, confessing of sins to one another, like James says, fellowship with other Christians, even when you're tired and just want to be by yourself, weekly worship gatherings, singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, having a, a, a active war in your thoughts to reject ungodly thoughts, uh, Philippians 4, 8, whatever's excellent, praiseworthy, you know, that whole list. Think on these things. Be active in this. And the Lord's Supper. Okay, those are normal things, but these are the most crucial and important things. In fact, Spurgeon, the great London Baptist preacher, said, Never neglect the means of grace. God may bless us when we are not in his house. Little context there. Um, Sometimes you'll go into church and you'll hear pastors, preachers, or someone like Spurgeon say, a church is God's house. We understand that in the Old Testament, the temple was the house of God and his manifest presence did actually dwell there in the Holy of Holies. But you remember when Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom and then his presence broke out. And now anywhere we worship, uh, we can worship because of the presence of God. However, when the church gathers on the Lord's day, which is Sunday, there is a unique presence of God there because we are together and we are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, like John 4 says with the conversation of the Samaritan woman and Jesus. So that's what Spurgeon means. He means in a church building during the the, the Lord's day gathering of worship, where we are praying, singing, uh, hearing the word preached all together, fellowshipping, taking communion together. That's what Spurgeon means by uh, God may bless us when we are not in his house. He means church. 
but we have the greater reason to hope that he will bless us when we are in communion with his saints. Amen, Spurgeon. Spurgeon's right. There are many Christians who believe, ah, you know, I can live the Christian life on my own. I don't need church. I don't need church membership. I don't need other people. It's just me and God. That's a very individualistic, very 2021 way of viewing Christianity. It's not a biblical way of viewing it. And so you can have that thought and practice that, but I can guarantee you are not flourishing and growing as a Christian if that's your thinking or practice of Christianity. Okay? If you're not submitted to good church leadership, if you're not dedicated in serving in a local church, if you're not regularly gathering with the saints on the Lord's Day, Sunday, to hear the preached word and to pray corporately and to take communion together with the rest uh, of the body and fellowship with that body regularly, consistently, you are not growing. You're not growing. And, and you can argue with me on that, but I, you may be growing in, in headspace because you listen to all the podcasts and you read all the books and, and you know, you're this deep theologian, but you're not growing in character and you're certainly not doing the one another's, which are simple obedience, because who are you doing them to if you're not doing them within your local church? And, and more on that to come. I don't want to spend all my time here on that point, but don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I, I need to tell you that in the Bible, Coming together with your local church for worship is not optional. Okay? If you're a student of the Bible, you realize this is not optional. In fact, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 is very explicit. Listen to what it says. Remember, he's writing to Hebrew Christians. I think it's Paul who wrote Hebrews. We don't know. Let us consider, think about, meditate on. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, okay? For love of Jesus and love of neighbor, we do the good works. That's the motivation. That's the two uh, pieces of the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, the law and the prophets hang. Let us consider how to stir one another up. Okay, that means provoke one another. That means encourage one another. In fact, that's what one translation says. Let us Consider how to encourage one another towards love and good deeds, love and good works. Okay, that's sanctification. Not neglecting. What? To meet together. That is the, the Sunday, Lord's Day worship gathering. Okay? Don't neglect the meeting together corporately of the church, as is the habit of some. Okay, 2,000 years ago, this was the habit of some. 2,000 years later in 2021, this is still the habit of some. Okay, as is the habit of some. But rather, here's the antithesis. Here's the opposite. Listen, but rather encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now that D is capitalized and we know what that means. Judgment day. Okay. Friends, judgment day is coming where we will all, every one of us individually, stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our lives. What did you do with the life I gave you? Did you use it for my glory? Did you do what I told you to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did you seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness so that then all these other things that the non-Christians chase could be added to you, but also that you would store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. This comes, friends, this sanctification progressively as we work together as a body. That's what it just said. Listen, consider how to stir one another up. Friends, Christianity is not an individualistic sport. <laughs> if you want to use sports analogies, you know, Olympics are on right now. Swimming is a big thing. Swimming is, yeah, you're on a team, but it's about your numbers and your time and how well you're doing. It's, it's, it's almost like golf, you know. You might have golfing buddies, but your golf game is you. And are you, how are you doing? Did you win the U.S. Open? Friends, the, Christianity is more like soccer and football and baseball and basketball, where the, it's a team sport, Okay? We need each other in Christianity. In fact, when you just read on a very light skim level the epistles, we're exhorted to do all these things to one another. And who are the one another? Friends, most clearly, it's those in your local church. 
Who is my neighbor? Well, yeah, it's anybody you come in contact with. But most clearly, it's the household of faith that you are connected to, that you're a member of. We'll get into that in, a, in another podcast on sanctification. I believe membership is a part of, of sanctification as well. So ending this podcast with Hebrews 10.24 the writer of Hebrews says, let us think about, let us be creative, let us be entrepreneurial, if you will, about how to stir one another up, how to encourage one another towards love and good deeds or sanctification. And let us consider how we can encourage one another, spur one another on, energize one another towards love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Man, that's so clear, as is the habit of some. But rather, encourage one another all the more as you see Judgment Day drawing near. Okay, friends. So big ideas to walk away with in this podcast. Sanctification is post-regeneration and, and justification and adoption. And it is not monergistic. It's synergistic in that it's us and God working together. Yes, God is the primary worker, but we then work this out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Secondly, it's progressive in that it doesn't instantly happen. It's not uh, instant microwavable soup. No, it is a slow, slow acorn to mighty oak tree progress. And so don't get discouraged if it's going slower than you'd like it to. This is by design. If you will, it's a feature, not a bug, that it takes a long time. Okay. And then lastly, friends, the local church is far more important to your sanctification than you realize. Don't think of it as a an accessory. No, it's not. It's part of the central thing that God uses to grow you. Okay. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll get on sanctification again, very practically in our next podcast. We'll take several on sanctification. I wanted to get this one, uh, concept wise, definition wise, and then show you that it's a, a process and a synergistic work of God in us. Uh, until next time, have a great day.